Hello everyone, a good morning, a good afternoon, a good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to Teacher Development Webinars. My name is Amanullah Sand. I facilitate virtual programs at Teacher Development Webinars. Teacher Development Webinars is a social action project implemented by British Council of Active Students in Pakistan as a response to COVID-19 crisis. It is an initiative to support teachers and educators around the world. We're thankful to Master English Training for sponsoring a Zoom account. And for our today's webinar, Creativity, Connectivity and Chaos, will explore the importance of creativity in teaching and learning. So like you that although the general definition of creativity is originally and uh, originality and novelty, often this can be achieved by establishing links between concepts, notions, or objects that have not existed before. And we'll discuss the value of creating the learning spaces with balance at the edge of chaos, yet provide opportunities for development and learning. We are pleased to introduce Dr. Tamas uh, for this webinar. Dr. Tamas works as an associate professor at Sangha University Center for English Language Studies. He has been involved with language teacher education programs in Europe, the Middle East, South Asia, Latin America, and Southeast Asia. His main research interests include language pedagogy, language teacher education, creativity, intercultural communication, the link between complex dynamic systems and education, and the role of culture in language teaching material. One of his latest projects has been on creativity in language teaching, which resulted in a co-authored book, Creativity and English Language Teaching, from inspiration to implementation. We are pleased to have you, Dr. Tamas, it's a prayer to welcome you here in the Development Webinar. A very warm welcome. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, are you going to let people in from the waiting room now? Because there are still people yep. waiting outside. Yep. Uh, yep. I'm all right, people are coming in. Excellent. Hello, everybody. Hope you are doing well. Um, and before we start uh, the session, I would like to ask you uh, to turn on your cameras and switch to gallery view because we are going to do something together. Okay, I, uh, you know, in uh, in Malaysia where I'm now, it's five o'clock in the afternoon. So I think a little bit of activity and exercise would be needed to make my brains work. Uh, in Pakistan, you are just after lunch. So again, I think you need a bit of exercise. So can please everybody turn on their cameras to start with? I can see lots of people in here, but most people are without a camera. So they come on, come on shy. people. They might be camera shy, but then we are not gonna work or it's not going to work what I'm going to do. Come on, people, don't, don't be camera shy. Please participate okay. if you can, you know, turn on your mic, uh, turn on your cameras. It's only the camera. I, 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 I promise I'm not going to judge you about how you look. OK. All right, we have one, two. Jian, come on, turn on your camera, please. I can see you cannot hide behind your profile picture. Thank you, Mohamed. It's nice to see you. Good job. Tatiana, can you please turn on your camera? Tatiana Pankova and a couple of other people there. Now it's, it's much better to see people because sometimes this is, this is my biggest problem with online teaching is that I don't see who I'm talking to. I usually see myself and yeah, I like talking to myself like every teacher does, but you know, it's, it's a bit sort of boring because you don't get the feedback. That, that usually you have. All right, without wasting too much time, I think, I think we've got enough people here, okay? So I want you to do some activity for me. I want you to follow my instructions and turn your head to the direction I tell you to, to do so. So when I say up, 
you have to tilt your head up and look at the ceiling. When I say down, you have to look down. When I say left, you look left. When I say right, you look right. But only your head, not your body. Are you ready? Good. Up. Down. Left. Right. Up. 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 Everybody. Yes. Right. But which right are we looking at? <laughs> People are looking at the different rights. All right. Yeah. Now, you're doing brilliantly. Now, what I'm going to do, I'll introduce a twitch into this very simple activity. Okay? We will reverse the meanings. So when I say up, you have to look down. When I say down, you have to look up. Right will mean left, and left will mean right. Are you ready? So let's look up. Good, right? Left, mm -hmm. down, up, up, left, down, right. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I, I, I think I yeah, managed to confuse you a little bit, okay? But this, this, this activity is going to be very important because we'll, be, we'll come back to this, okay? So let me start sharing my, uh, my slides so that we have, uh, uh, we can start the session proper. So what I'm going to do, I will share the slides behind me. So hopefully you will be able to see me and the slides together rather than just me in a very small window and the slides being bigger. All right, so can, can you see me together with the slides? Yeah. Perfect, so that we can start. So one of the, the, the first things that I would like to talk about is how the pandemic, the coronavirus situation has, has completely messed up our teaching practices. Um, when I started my first ever online lesson, I was teaching a secondary school uh, group and I was using Telegram as my teaching uh, platform. Telegram is a texting app. It's very similar to uh, WhatsApp. And oh boy, whatever could go wrong actually went wrong. I mixed up my ups and downs and, and lefts and rights and I, and I didn't know what I was doing. An activity which I planned to last for two minutes lasted for 15 something that I planned to last for a longer time ended up very shortly because the participants the students were not contributing or they were not doing what I wanted to do. So the whole world turned upside down. So what I had to do in this new situation is, is, is trying to cope. And coping was not easy. This semester at the university, I have been teaching two courses I never taught before and I was using a platform that I never used before. Just like many of you, everything was new to me. And what I had to do, I had to unlearn some of the skills that I was equipped with, equipped with as a teacher. You know, I was trained to operate in a physical classroom. I had the skills, I had the expertise to manage group work. Now, most of those skills were irrelevant and I had to learn new skills just to keep my head above the surface. And I'm still trying and I'm still, still struggling to be quite honest, because I don't have, as I told you, I don't have the, the human connection with my learners. But what I also noticed was that there were quite a few teachers who were actually thriving in this new environment. And these teachers were not necessarily the ones who were very tax savvy. They were not necessarily the ones who were who were the most computer literate, or they were not necessarily the ones who were the most diligent. They were very successful, of course, but the most successful teachers were, I believe, the ones who showed high levels of creativity. So creativity is not something new. I mean, creativity is, is a very important uh, part of, of 21st century education. I mean, we have, uh, 
educational frameworks, which mention creativity. We have, we have national curricula, local syllabi. They all talk about the importance of creativity. Creativity has become a very common term for everybody. Most people think of creativity as, as, as a born trait, something that, that you are born with. So people either have it or they don't have it. And because it's considered to be a born trait, teachers sometimes have troubles with how to develop or implement it in the classroom. And that also has an impact on how people view creativity. Because if it's a born trait, then you are trying to look for signs that makes you a creative person. So people were saying that if you, if you have a messy office or a messy desk, that's a clear sign that you are a creative person, right? Because we have creative people like Jean Piaget, who had a very messy office. So if he was a creative person, and if he has such a messy desk, that your own messy desk is, is not a sign of being untidy, it's a sign of being creative, right? Uh, people also say that if you're a night owl, then you are a creative person. And actually, there, there's some scientific evidence which suggests that, that people who stay up at night and do their work at night have a, a certain cognitive edge over uh, people who, who get up early, like myself. But there's a very important thing about night owls. It does matter how you spend your nights. So for example, if you, if you are up all night on a social uh, networking platform, for example, Twitter, and you're happy tweeting through the whole night, it might not mean that you are very creative. It may mean that you are a stable genius, right? Uh, well, there is no scientific evidence to back this up besides some self-proclaimed statements from certain individuals, but you get the point. So people see creativity everywhere and in every form. Not necessarily in the case of Mr. Trump, of course. The most common and accepted definition of creativity is having original ideas that have value. That, that, was, that was coined by Ken Robinson. And there are two very important key words in this definition. One is originality and the other is value. So let's, let's try to unpack these, these two to see what they mean. So originality means that, that something new is created, something that did not exist before. And, but again, you know, it's, it's difficult to, to say what is new because sometimes Things that are used in a particular context may be new in that context, but they have existed before. So usually we break up originality and creativity into two larger categories. One is historic creativity and the other is personal creativity. So historic creativity is when things are invented, done for the first time, performed for the first time in human history. Like, um, <clears throat> Shakespeare's plays or, or Einstein's theory of relativity belongs into that category. Personal creativity is a little bit tricky because we, we judge the, the importance of personal creativity in the context of the individual. So for example, if your language learner comes up with a new grammatical structure, constructs a sentence using a new grammar structure, by overgeneralizing from examples that they have heard before, and we can consider that to be personally creative, personal creativity. Another possibility is that, you know, the students are coming up with a new word. They coin a new word. They, they sometimes they, they uh, uh, combine their mother tongue with the, with the English language. And, you know, just to make fun for the sound of it. And they, they come up with a new word that again belongs to personal creativity. The other uh, thing that we need to talk about in this definition is value. So originality by itself is not enough. It has to be appreciated by other people. So going back to the example of the language learner coming up with a, with a new word, if, if their peers don't like it, don't appreciate it, then no value is attached to the word so therefore, it's not going to be considered creative. Another example would be, um, I think most of you are teachers. 
Another example would be if, let's say, you would go into your classroom stark naked. That would be original, right? You haven't done that before. I, I hope you say you haven't done that before. Because in, in most cases, I think the, the value would be questionable. Definitely in my case, the value would be questionable. Okay? So it's not enough to be original. You have to have value. Another means of sort of talking about creativity is when something is, is used for the first time in a context which it has never been used before. And I can think of uh, a Malaysian teacher, uh, Samuel Isaiah, who was in the top 10 runner-up for the Global Teacher Award for this year. He's working with Orang Asli children, indigenous children in Malaysia. And he, for example, one of his ideas was that he introduced uh, and, and bought ukuleles to, to his students. So through, through music, he was encouraging and motivating his students to pursue education. Now, the use of music as a motivational tool in education is not new. I mean, we have seen that before, but we haven't seen it in the context Sam actually applied it. So that, again, can be considered as creative problem solving. And finally, one more type of creativity is when you're not creating something absolutely new, but you are linking up concepts, ideas, objects in an absolutely novel way to create something that has not existed before. Um, and it, of course, it has value. For example, think about uh, when you discover a new shortcut on your morning commute and that shortens your travel time. You're very happy and that adds value to your daily life. Whereas other people are just treading along the usual pathways, you are out venturing, trying to find out new ways to, to make your life easier. So you are connecting uh, different things uh, in, a, in a creative way. Or the same about with friends. I, I think we usually uh, interact with the same people around us. I mean, not many of us are going out actively talking to strangers to see who we can connect up and who we can, can pair with, right? <clears throat> I think most of you might have heard about this whole connectivity issue. So connecting people together, connecting new ideas together. And our world is really well connected. But just because we are very well connected, it doesn't mean that new connections cannot be formed. Do you know how many people live now on, on our planet? Does anybody know that? Maybe you can add, add your answer into the chat box. How many people do you think live in the world today? I'm not giving you time to Google the answer. So just simply type in what you know. 7.2 billion says Henrietta. Not exactly 7 billion. Yeah, it, it's about 7.8 billion, I think. I, I just Googled it before the session, so I, I know the answer is very easy for me. Now, you probably heard about uh, the six degrees of separation or the, uh, the uh, small world problem. Uh, this suggests that everybody in the world can be reached by six connections. So I know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody else, and then every single person in the world can be reached in just six short steps. And that's quite mind boggling. I mean, think about it. We, we are talking about almost 8 billion people. So you can choose two random people and they can be reached in six degrees, six steps. It's quite something. Um, the original idea for the six degrees of separation, believe it or not, comes from Hungary, from a Hungarian writer called Frigyes Karinti. In 1928, he wrote a short story with the title Chains. And in the short story, there are a couple of friends in a Budapest cafe, and they are talking about politics, the arts, and also about how the world is shrinking and how everybody seems to be connected, mind you. This was 1929, and actually this was a 
bit earlier because the story set a few years before. So one of the person who suggested that now you can reach anybody in the world in seven steps, he's talking about seven steps, not six steps. Uh, and his friends were challenging him and they set him a challenge to link himself to Selma Lagerlöf, who is a Swedish writer who won the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1909. So the, 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 the proponent of the game said that, hmm, how can we do that? And then he said, you know, actually it's very easy because Selma Lagerlöf must know King Gustav V because by default, the Nobel Prize is presented by the King of Sweden. Now, King Gustav was a very uh, avid tennis player. He was a very good tennis player. He entered into uh, international tennis tournaments. So the next link, he said that he knows that King Gustav actually played tennis with a Hungarian tennis player, Kerling Bela. So they must know each other. And then he said that he is also a good friend of Mr. Kerling. So in about three steps, they established a contact between Selma Laganov and the guy who proposed the game. And then they had a couple of other runs to prove that it does work. This idea was picked up by Stanley Milgram in the 1960s, at the end of the 1960s. Uh, because his famous experiment when he was working at Harvard University uh, that, that he titled The Small World Problem. So what he did, he picked a target person in Boston and then he asked participants from three Midwestern towns to send a letter to the target person. But they only knew the name of the person and his occupation, nothing else. So their task was to find somebody they knew personally who could forward the letter to this Boston target person. So in a way, what was happening is that they had to uh, come up with a link to the next person, who have to think about a link to the next person and to the next person and to the final person, to the target person. So in a way, what they were doing is they were creating a new link between the source and the target. Now you may say, yeah, but what's creative in that? Well, it's creative in a sense that it's creative problem solving. The problem was to get the letter to the target person in Boston and try to find links through which this was possible. So most of the letters managed to, to reach the target person in about six steps. Some didn't reach at all. Some reached er, in fewer steps. Some reached uh, a, a few more, but everything got there. This is what I would like you to try out now. How you are connected. So I'm going to give you two famous people. And I would like you to think about how you can get to these people in less than six steps. So the people that I have in mind are Priyanka Chopra and Johnny Depp, all right? So I would like the gentleman to focus on Priyanka Chopra. I don't think that's gonna be a very difficult task for you. And I would like the ladies to focus on Johnny Depp. Now try to think of somebody who I know somebody who might know another person who is connected directly to your target person. I'll give you about two minutes to think about the, the possible connections, and I would like you to type out your answers in the chat box, okay? So time starts now. How can you get to Priyanka Chopra? And how can you get to Johnny Depp? Yeah, somebody said that they can be connected via Hollywood film director. I, I don't want you to 
create a link between Priyanka Chopra and Johnny Depp. Create a link between you and Priyanka Chopra or you and Johnny Depp. Thanks for audience. How would you clear the plan? Meanwhile, I'm not checking uh, Facebook comments if there are any. Okay. Through his Facebook page, come on, he might not answer you. It has to be a personal connection. It, 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 it cannot be just a, uh, a Facebook page. I give you one more minute to think about that. This is creative problem solving. Okay, this is what you have to do as teachers all the time. Don't use social media, don't use Facebook, okay? It's not allowed. You need flesh and blood people who can connect. Someone says to, you know, have EA? No, that's not accepted. I need different people. Nancy saying it's difficult because they are famous, but every, okay, so somebody said, Henny says, I know an ex-photographer uh, who probably knows Andy Weiner's daughter, and Andy Weiner is famous film director who might know Johnny Depp. That's a very good, that's a very good reasoning. I taught you well, Henny. I'm very proud of you. Henny was my student mm -hmm. back in Hungary many, many years ago. So if I could, you know, tell you, I don't know about Priyanka Chopra, but uh, I'm a great fan of uh, Sir Ken Robinson and the work, you know, he was advocating. So my all time wish was to meet him. And, uh, but if I could, you know, uh, find a link to Sir Ken Robinson. So I think he's working, in, uh, you know, I'm also a hundred investor, hundred is a film organization. So uh, I could, you know, find a link to reach uh, Dr. Kate, Kate Robinson, to, you know, 100 Mr. And to Kate, I could, re uh, you know, have reached uh, Ken Robinson. It's, it's, okay, okay. It, it's perfect. We discuss it uh, outside the session. I, I would like to know how to get to her, okay? Uh, if, my, uh, if my partner is listening to this, okay, uh, you know, baby, this is just a joke, okay? I, I, I will not get to Priyanka Chopra. <laughs> and, anyways, let me just give you an example. So how I would get to Johnny Depp? One of my good friends lives in the UK. He's called Jeff Gibson. Actually, he was my methodology, ELT methodology tutor when I was uh, uh, doing my BA. So Jeff knows Daniel Day-Lewis because they went to school together. And I have a hunch that Daniel Day-Lewis knows Johnny Depp personally because they were together at the 2008 Oscar Gala. But even if Johnny Depp doesn't know Daniel Day Lewis personally, they were using or working with the same director at a different uh, uh, time, Michael Mann. So my link would be uh, my friend Jeff Gibson, then Daniel Day Lewis, and if needed, Michael Mann. So three steps. So what we need to do is to, to try to think about creatively uh, about creating new connections. But of course, it's not just about uh, people. You can create many links between ideas, concepts, objects, other things. Like you can see the picture behind me. There are lots of objects in this picture. Can you think of any possible categories you can make? Again, you, you can enter your answers into the chat box. So what kind of categories can you make from all these different objects? Okay, I can see instruments, devices, looks like Woodstock, literature, painting, music, could be musical instruments, symbols, arts, very nice. But you know what you are doing now is basically you are employing a kind of visual shorthand. You are focusing on the, the obvious, which is, which is already there. So yes, you can, you can make groups like different drinks, different musical instruments, different faces or aliens or other objects. But what you are not doing is you are not looking at what's not there, but what could be there. 
for example, you could maybe connect instruments, drinks, faces to a particular musical genre like jazz or rock. Or you can just create categories based on what you like and what your partner likes. So what I'm trying to say is that in order to be creative, you need to use your imagination. So it's not just simply seeing what is there, but seeing also what could be there. No wonder uh, Ken Robinson and Lou Arlika called creativity as applied imagination. Because they were saying that imagination is something that really sets us apart from anything else that lives on this planet. Because imagination allows us to, to break out from the here and now to the multitudes of possibilities, either future or past. But mind you, they are talking about applied imagination, which is different from simple imagination. So we are not talking about daydreaming. We are talking about imagination, which has a particular value and particular practical application. And this is what successful teachers during the pandemic are using. They are using applied imagination because what they are doing is they are reimagining imagining, uh, pedagogy. I'm sorry, the, somehow the slides seem to be a little bit distorted. Okay, now I think it's better. I think I was at the edge of my green screen, so this is why you didn't see it, it properly. So successful teachers during the pandemic are basically using imagination. You are, they are using applied imagination to make connections between things that did not exist before. If you think about it, all the tools that we are using were not developed for teaching or learning purposes. The apps, for example, WhatsApp or, or Telegram or even Zoom, they were not designed for teaching purposes. So successful teachers are trying to connect a tool, an application with a pedagogical goal, a learning objective. They, they are reforming ideas. They are connecting ideas that have not existed before to provide an effective and successful learning environment for their learners. So what we have been talking about is that creativity is very important, right? We talked about how creativity is not necessarily coming up with something absolutely novel, but creativity can also lie in forging new connections between things if those connections did not exist before. And successful teachers, very creative teachers are exactly doing that. They are connecting new ideas together to create learning opportunities for the learners in their classrooms. This is actually what takes us to the, to the third point that I was going to talk about, chaos. How, how do we get here? I'll, I'll, I'll explain it a, a little bit more because, because so far we have seen how creativity and connectivity are important, but where do we get creativity and connectivity? When you were looking at the, the picture behind me, the picture with the random objects, you were looking at, you were trying to establish an order through categorizing those two things. And this is very typical of, of, of human nature. We try to categorize things into, into distinct uh, uh, groups. We try to see things as, uh, as opposites, as, as polar opposites of each other, like chaos and order. Luckily, in the natural world, these things do exist, but there is a lot more in between chaos and order. This is what uh, Chris Langton, an American uh, scholar, was looking into. Chris Langton was working at the Santa Fe Institute, uh, where they were in New Mexico, where they were looking at uh, complex dynamic systems. And, and Dr. Langton's area 
was artificial life. He was not looking at artificial intelligence. He was looking at artificial life. He was trying to mimic and recreate life in a laboratory uh, environment. As they were looking at how life might be created, they realized that through the randomness of certain elements from the primordial soup, as the, the previous theory held, life would be very, almost impossible to create because the randomness is just producing so many numbers, so many varieties that for a, a feasible life form to emerge from that would, would be beyond the, the possibilities. So what Chris Langton was, was working on, he realized that between order and chaos, there's something else. This is something that he called the edge of, of chaos. So he said that, he, he, he used the analogy of uh, phase uh, transition. You know, materials in, in the real world uh, exist in different forms. So we can talk about materials which, which, which form as gas, we can talk about materials which are fluid, and we can talk about solids. I'm sure some chemistry teacher can explain it much better than I do. But anyways, certain materials can take different forms. So this is why in chemistry, uh, they are talking about them as, as phases. And as the uh, materials are changing forms, they, they call that phase transition. It's a little bit similar to how water freezes up and becomes ice. Water, <clears throat> is liquid and in its liquid form it represents chaos because there are billions of water molecules bumping to each other bouncing around forming new connections in every millisecond they are so chaotic you cannot predict how water will will behave but when water freezes over and it becomes ice all the molecules are locked into order they keep their order, they keep their connections, and they don't move and produce a very orderly system. Now, Lento was saying that as water is becoming ice, there's something magical is happening. Because the system starts to become stable. It starts to become stable to store information, but yet it is still flexible to allow for new connections to be formed. So that kind of sort of phase transition, that kind of sort of narrow edge between order and chaos is what he called the edge of chaos. In, in Mitchell Waldrop's words, this is the mysterious something that makes life and mind possible. And I would, I would further the, this, this uh, definition, I would say that it's not just what makes life and mind possible, but this is where creativity exists, on the edge of chaos. Why am I saying that? What is needed for creativity? What, what is, what is that, that, that special thing that allows us to create something new? If we have a, a chaotic system, we know that nothing new can come out of that because chaos is just too chaotic for anything meaningful to come out, anything that we plan. If we have order, nothing can come out from an orderly system, nothing new can come out from an orderly system. So neither chaos nor order is very conducive for creativity because chaos is just too random, order is too stru structured. So nothing can come out from order or chaos. Everything has to come out from the edge of chaos when the system is flexible enough, but not locked up, it's not fossilized. So in order to be creative, what you need is lots of points, lots of bits of information from your own expert fields and also from around the world, general knowledge, because if you have those different bits of information, that's when you can restructure them and create new connections. If 
your knowledge is fossilized. If your knowledge is set in an order, you cannot be creative. If you are too chaotic, then again, nothing will come out. So you will have to keep an open mind. You will have to be flexible enough for your mind to be able to create new connections, okay? This is what makes creative people tick and creative people work. Many people ask me, how can I become a creative teacher? And I usually give them an answer by quoting Robert Persig and uh, from his book, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. In that book, somebody asked the, the, the author how to paint a perfect painting. And he said, you know, you want to know how to paint a perfect painting? It's, it's easy. Make yourself perfect and then just paint naturally. I've got the same idea about creativity. You know how to, you want to know how to become a, a, a creative teacher? It's easy. Just makes yourself creative and then teach naturally. Okay, but again, the question is how to become a creative teacher. Lucky for you that I have the answer for that. Uh, two years ago, uh, I published a book with Alan Maley, uh, Creativity and English Language Teaching from Inspiration to Implementation. And in that book, we discuss many different ideas about how you can improve yourself as a person to be more creative and how you can improve yourself as a teacher to be more creative. Very simple things like keep learning, try to learn a new skill, try to learn something new that you haven't done before. Because as you expand your horizons, as you have more information, you've got more knowledge, then the possibilities of connecting new ideas to already existing ones is just exploding. Sometimes in my teaching, I'm using uh, uh, examples from films. I, I, I like bringing in movies and I use the, the movie analogy to teach something. And then I, I remember that one time one of my students asked me, sir, when you are watching a movie, are you, are you taking notes on how you can use this stuff in, in teaching? I said, no, but because I, I love watching movies, sometimes ideas click and then I make the link how I can use a particular idea particular movie clip to illustrate a teaching idea, okay? So when you, when, when you reach the point when there are many ideas around and you are still flexible enough to, to create new connections, then you become a creative teacher. But check out the book. I think it's a, I think it's a pretty good book. And, and I, I, I don't think that I am alone with this, with this opinion. So it's, it's not a biased idea. I think Alan also thinks that this is a, a brilliant book. So if you, if you want to check it, it is there out in the market, you can check it and, and you can see how to become a, a creative person. I cannot send you a, a copy of the book, unfortunately, because it's quite a, an expensive book, but you know, if something exists, I'm sure it's somewhere on the internet. So if you look hard enough, you will be able to find the book. And with that lovely thought on piracy and uh, stealing other people's intellectual product, I would like to end my talk and thank you for being here in this afternoon or morning, or wherever you are, according to the time zone and spending this time with, with me. So if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. You can see my email on the slide. Uh, you can also put, take it down and then you know, if you would like to email me, I'm also happy to answer the questions. But here, if anybody has any questions, I'm also happy to answer. Thank you so very much, Amaz, for this you know, interactive session. It was great to hear you uh, <coughs> this afternoon and uh, you know, great ideas about creativity and connection. Thank you very much. So if there are any questions, please put them in the chat box and uh, we'll be posting them to a presenter at the Tamar. All right, but if you've got any questions now, you are, you are free to ask them here. 
How can we creatively yeah. motivate the learners to appreciate reading? Ah, I think this is the question that you have to answer yourself. Uh, there, there are many different ways of, 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 of uh, getting your learners to read. Um, you can create a, a, a learning, a reading uh, a competition. You can put out a, a collection of books in the classroom. Students can pick a book and then they can tick which book they have read. So and by the end of the month, you can see how many ticks certain students have. So if you turn something into competition, it's always appealing to students because who doesn't like winning, right? There's another question. How can we make the students get rid of the fossilized idea that they are not, that, uh, they are not creative? Okay, in, in the classroom, if you want to create a, a, a creative atmosphere in your classroom, you have to balance your teaching between chaos and between order. One of the things that teachers do uh, very often is that they don't dare to ask questions for which they don't already know the answer. You know, in, in, in classroom situations, you ask questions like, what's the capital of the UK, London? Uh, what's the boiling temperature of water, 100 degrees? Teachers very rarely ask questions, genuine questions for which they don't know the answer. Because by asking questions, you're actually controlling the class. Everything has to take place the way you plan. If you do that, what, well, what's happening is that you lock your classroom in order. Nothing new can come out from it. If you ask questions which are genuine and which will get the students to explore ideas, come up sometimes with silly answers, that's absolutely fine, then you have a chance for creating an environment which is supporting creativity. So be brave. Let your students learn rather than insisting on teaching. Uh, there, uh, there's a comment, you know, that the creativity begins in early years. Do you have some ideas for moms to support children, children at home? I would also like you to talk about, you know, is it really true that creativity begins in early years? Okay, so, so how can you create your students to be more creative at home? I, I think every parent needs to, needs to support that, that children's creativity. Um, and, and you do that in many different forms. Uh, play is a perfect way to foster students' creativity. So instead of making them uh, uh, sit by the desk all day or in front of the computer, and, and learn the material that they set in school. Encourage them to play. Play is a very important part of child development. When they play, they are trying to try and get new ideas. They're, they're trying to, to, to formulate new things. Give, give kids uh, a box of Legos or any kind of building blocks, and you will see how they learn about physics, how they learn about structure as they are trying to build a tall tower. Um, in other forms, uh, you, can, you can create treasure hunts in, in the flat. You can write riddles for your, for your children that they have to solve until they find the next clue and the next clue, which will probably lead to a bar of chocolate. But for any kind of motivation, there should be a reward at the end because then it becomes fun, okay? So you as a parent, can do a lot to encourage your children's uh, uh, creativity. However, if you just simply let them watch YouTube videos or, or Netflix for the whole day, I don't think that that, that particular activity will, will uh, develop their creativity, okay? So I know sometimes it's difficult that it takes time for you to get up and, 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 and play with your kids, but please do. What was the, the other question, Allah? Sorry, I forgot. Uh, can, uh, you know, do you agree with the idea that creativity, you know, can be learned or achieved at the earlier years of age? Right, but creativity can definitely be developed. So creativity, if, if you look at, if you look at uh, the mind as something which is, which is developing, you can have an open or a closed mindset. If you look at the concept of open mind, it means that we develop and we learn uh, all through our lives. 
this is why I don't like the idea of, of IQ tests, because IQ tests will categorize you as having a particular intelligence, and they don't allow for the idea that you can grow as a human being. I mean, why is it that your intelligence quota is given at birth? I think, I think you can develop your mathematical skills, you can develop your reading skills, you can develop your problem solving skills. So if that is true, then why not your creativity? It's, it's how you do things, it's, it's how you break routines, how you establish new connections, how you are trying to broaden your horizons where you become a more creative person. Great. So uh, we have this question on Facebook about critical thinking that how far uh, this critical the creative ideas help in developing uh, critical thinking skills and analytical skills. I, th I think critical critical thinking is 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 very closely connected to creativity in a way because and it's a very important skill especially in the age of fake news because children mm -hmm. have to learn well everybody has to learn how to differentiate uh, ideas from ideology, how they, they need to recognize that they are being led to accept a particular point of view rather than they, they learn how to think for themselves. And critical thinking is something that every teacher needs to install in their students, regardless of subject area. Critical thinking means is that you step out of your traditional teacher role because traditional teacher roles uh, expect students to, to learn what the teacher says because the teacher's truth is always the only one truth. So through critical thinking, you allow your students to explore their own ideas and establish something which is true for themselves. Critical thinking and critical reading especially it's very important because you get students to look at the language like detectives and try to find out why particular words are used the way they are used. How, for example, a digital text, which can be a multimodal text, is framed. Imagine that there's a political rally and uh, at the political rally, there are only six very elderly people in the audience. And one particular news outlet is presenting about the, uh, the rally by showing a close up of the speaker who is using wide gestures and looking very energetic. Whereas another news outlet will take a picture from behind the speaker and show the empty audience. What they are trying to do, both of them, they're trying to manipulate you to accept something. So you have to question what you see. If there's only one angle is presented, you have to ask yourself, what is another possible angle? What is another possible explanation? Why is this what I read presented in a particular way? I'm not really an expert on, on critical thinking and critical reading, but, but definitely creativity and, and criticality go hand in hand. Great. So if we have, you know, other questions, I don't see any other question in the chat box. So thank you very much for your participation. Thanks, Tamaz, for a great presentation and wonderful ideas. We really appreciate that. And, uh, you know, it was kind of, uh, creative presentation like a creative topic so yeah thanks very much thank you for your participation we'll be bringing a more webinars for you at teacher development webinars uh, you can see uh, social media channels and follow us on twitter facebook instagram and this recording will be made available at a youtube channel later and so you can view and feel free to share it I would like to remind you at this point that you know COVID-19 cases have been rising as we see second wave in Pakistan here. Please be safe, be a mask, practice social distancing, and please be responsible for your lives, your family's lives, and the lives of your loved ones. 
in these are really critical times we need to be responsible and we need to act responsible in these times so yeah please be safe and now you know i want to stop my share and if we could uh, take a picture together and in gallery you that would be great <laughs>